um, about religion itself or about the existence of God or of a creator or something like that. So Which your way? belief about, say, uh, your position of agnosticism, yeah. if you define what it is and whether you think it's the right position. Right, agnosticism. Agnosticism, uh, for me at least, is to uh, realize that there's a possibility of the existence of God because it's not something that can be disproven, but uh, that it also can't be proven. Right. And the main reason for that is that uh, humans are not God. I don't believe that humans are God. I don't think so, you know? Uh, so, a finite human being, even if God exists, even if an absolute being like God exists, he cannot assert the existence of God, no matter how much he tries, no matter which way, which proof is brought to him, you know? That's, at least that's in my opinion. There's other arguments, but that's one of the main ones. So you would say your position is, um, a type of weak agnosticism, right? So Quite from, weak. <laughs> from, from the perspective that um, strong agnostics would be like, we are like 99% sure there's no God, right? And um, it's, it's extremely unlikely. So like Richard Dawkins would, would be a type of strong agnostic. You're, you seem like a weak agnostic, would that right. be correct? I disagree, but uh, I'll agree on something with you. Um, in the way that the existence of God, uh, saying that God exists, I can't say what's the percentage of possibility. I don't think uh, anybody can, really. But I can say that there's a higher possibility that you are There's God. a possibility there's a fight going on there right now. There is a fight going <laughs> on, yeah. We're getting the, the crowd stolen. Yeah, but. we are getting the crowd stolen. But anyway, look, when it comes to atheism, and I want to have a, obviously a few discussions with you because you come to the park quite often. Uh, what I want to speak about is the implications of atheism and the implications of agnosticism. Now, one of the things which I speak about, and I spoke about yesterday, yesterday, so it's fresh at the top of my head, is that if you believe in a worldview in which God is not a reality, then everything ultimately has no meaning, value, purpose, and there's no certainty in it. So life is meaningless, right? What would you say to that? Because I believe this is a strong argument against weak and strong agnosticism and atheism. Right. Another mic. Oh, uh, not, another fight broke up. <laughs> this one is closer. Maybe, maybe you guys should do this first, so we can do this. Ah, no, 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 she's leaving. Never mind, never mind. So you were saying that, uh, uh, what was the question? Okay. I got this. So yesterday I was giving a talk about atheism, agnosticism, and the implications of it. So before we speak about whether atheism or theism is true, or agnosticism in your case, weak agnosticism or strong agnosticism. Uh, yeah, remember, you, you're saying that life has no purpose if you follow that kind of ideal. Is that yes, right? Yes. Yeah, right, life has no purpose. Nihilism, basically. Nihilism. Not exactly, but it's going uh, to that direction, more or less. I believe in probability. The things right. that we can assert with the senses that we have. I don't believe our senses are perfect, but with our senses we can assert somewhat the probability of the world that is around us. Of course, we can still be mistaken in it, but we can achieve certainty even if it's limited to us as finite beings, you know? So I think we can achieve certain truths, even though we might still be wrong, but uh, uh, we basically choose what we decide to follow. For example, you chose to be a Muslim. As Christians chose to be Christians, as I choose to be an agnostic. Yeah, I get that, but my question is slightly different. My question is, what do you think about the purpose of life or life being meaningless under your perspective, under your worldview? Do you believe there's any objective purpose to why we exist? There can be, but I don't think people can assert that with uh, certainty, because again, again they're fine. Okay, so what, what, would you, what would you say is the purpose of your life? Of my life. Very good question. So, the purpose of my life, I chose many different objectives in my life to be my purpose, you know. Um, let's say one of them is to have children, one of them is to keep living. So it's, like, it's like a Darwinian purpose? More or less. I mean, look, humans are also animals, except that humans are much more developed animals. The basic animal needs is actually something that religion helps a lot with, because religion gives uh, organization in a society, gives, uh, gives purpose to people who find themselves uh, as purposes. You know, I see lots of youths these days saying, oh, you know, I never want to have kids, I never want to marry, I never want to have any of that, because it's bullshit, I just want to keep living uh, the life as it is. I don't agree with that. So, so you're, you're kind of saying religion, and this, this goes into my favorite area, yeah. religion promotes, uh, in a way, uh, reproduction and survival yeah, yeah, yeah. and these types of things. Okay. So, useful, so yeah. would you say for you 
religion is um, an evolved adaptation for, for, the, for us to survive? That's a good question. Yes and no. Okay. Uh, so that, that's the best answer. <laughs> yeah. Because in safer, a way, safer. It, yeah, you know, no, but look, I'll explain why. I'll explain. Sure. In a way, it is, but in a way, it is. Religion is uh, very good for. Okay, look, this is going to be very controversial. I know I'll get mo lots of people angry because of this, but I, I don't see uh, it. Uh, I don't see the world the same way that religious people do. I see the world as two ideologies, opposing ideologies. There's the ideology of the wolves, and there's the ideology of the sheep. And the religion is for the sheep. It's for the followers. The wolves are the ones who rule, are the rulers, are the kings, the generals, the emperors. They don't care about religion. They use religion to create a purpose for the sheep, to fight for their ambitions. So, what, so it's used to organize yeah, humanity. Cor correct me if I'm wrong, so that idea of Marx, as in religion is the opium of the masses. Yeah, I don't agree with it. You don't agree with it? No, no, no. Okay, but what you're saying, religion is a way of just controlling people? Yes. Okay, but couldn't we say that about any organized human activity ultimately falls into the category of wolves and sheep? Absolutely. Almost all of the different ideologies. I, including atheist movements. Including, uh, in, well, that depends. <laughs> that depends. If atheism is based on debating against religion, then yeah, it can be used for power. If atheism is simply the act of not being religious and not even speaking about religion, then I don't see how that can be used to achieve power. But that's but it's but the, the same thing applies to religion. So someone is religious, but they're not imposing on someone else. But like what you said about wolves and sheep is, let, let's apply this to secularism or liberalism, or even communist China, right? So you have these ideals that people believe in, and they impose these on society. And for them, they are the wolves and the people are the sheep. So your analogy would apply just as much to secular ideologies as much as it would apply to religious ideologies. It does, but there's a um, small differentiation. Uh, you know, we can give, I can give plenty, plenty of examples of countries that didn't have religion, but replaced it with something else, like the Soviet Union, perfect example. No religion, but they had the cult but of they, personality. No, but they did have a religion. In the Soviet Union? Yeah. What was it? Communism. That's, I wouldn't call it a religion. Okay, for, okay. For, let, let's go with the definition of religion. I'm going to give you a definition. I guess if you want to go with semantics, you could it's, it's, compare it, it to it's, it's, religion. It's, 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 I, would I would say it's a full blown out religion in the same way Darwinism is a religion. Because religion ultimately is a term which you can apply to a worldview which subscribes to something supernatural or does not subscribe to something supernatural. It could even refer to a beliefs and values which are unjustified, which people hold on to. So for example, when we look at liberalism, liberalism is also a religion because it's based upon the assumption, the Hobbesian assumption of human nature, which is unprovable. And when it comes to Darwinism, uh, this is even which academics have recognized that it's actually a religion. Apart from being a scientific theory, it's also a religion. Likewise, scientism, communism, all of these ideologies, ultimately, they have ideals which are untouchable and those untouchable ideals means that these worldviews are in fact religions. I would say if you compare liberalism to communism to a religion, for example like Christianity or Islam, um, liberalism stands a bit to the side because liberalism is more about the discussion of the different uh, you know, ideas. Of course there's some ideas that are considered absolute, for example the idea of free speech. We need to have free speech. Also, but, but look, you're, you're talking about Firstly, liberalism doesn't allow absolute free speech. That, that's true. Okay. Depends on the liberalism. Okay. Uh, Give me one liberal state in the world which allows absolute free speech. There isn't. There isn't. Okay. And no has there ever been historically. There isn't. At least not in practice. Okay. In yeah. theory, they might be, but in practice, the but people what in power is, will always try to, you know, yeah, of course, yeah. down the ones who The second thing is the Hobbesian worldview that is, it's man's life was short, brutish, and difficult, right? Is, is what every human for himself ultimately, right? So that, the, 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 the state of nature, which is ultimately what they derive liberal values from, uh, and, and that, that's the presupposition, that's the presupposition that they actually use, those are unprovable, right? So it is in fact a religion. They are not provable in um, the way that, for example, uh, <laughs> That in the way that, for example, a chemical reaction is, you know, it's not as clear as that. 
but yeah, because we're speaking about values here. Values you can never prove in the same way. Yes, you can't prove values as an absolute, but you can prove values as a, a function, and that is and that is what I strive for. It's functionality well, well, in a society. Okay, so I don't agree with that. L l let's think about this. So give me an example of um, values which are which are provable through function. Bravery. Bravery, yes. Okay. Loyalty. Okay. Would you say loyalty and bravery is good? Yes. Okay. Let's add something to it. Would you believe, w would you say that... I know where you're going. Should, yeah, we're, we're headed in that direction. Go on, go on, yeah. Go on. So, would you say truth is also something good? Yes, it's good. Okay. Now, all of these value claims are something which you have to presuppose, yes. but not something you can prove. Yes, yes. They don't have an absolute justification, but I would say that they're good because they're history. They have been proven to work. You know, what, in a society. What, what, what do you mean by work? To work to uh, uh, to get humans into a cohesive society. Right. That means maximizing pleasure, basically. Maximizing productivity, maximizing Ma happiness, whatever you want to call it. For me, it's more about the continuation of mankind, of mankind's existence. But no, but pa or the supremacy so, of mankind. Uh, Pavlo, the, the problem with that is that's. That's too general and you can have a very brutal society which allows the continuation of human beings like yes. eugenic type models, yes, right? Yes. Where they kill off the weak, they kill off the colored people and they just um, keep the strong white men. You could. Why white? I said eugenics. Oh, eugenics doesn't necessarily need to be about whites. But yeah, look, no, I, but, I would but, say... But the people behind the eugenics movement, the social Darwinists, they believe the whites to be the most superior. That's why I said it. Sure, sure. But look, I would argue that that is not beneficial overall for humanity because there's plenty of people that don't fall under the, for example, perfect body shape, blah, 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 condition that they want. And that can be very useful for humanity. Stephen Hawking is the best example. He's a cripple. He, he can't, no, move. But, he can't okay, do anything, okay, but, but from, he's a genius. Okay, okay. So from your perspective of agnosticism, why is, the val why is the life of Stephen Hawking more important than the life of, say, that Christian preacher over there? Than the Christian preacher? Well, if you, uh, in which way, in which situation are you looking? Un under your agnostic worldview, why would Stephen Hawking be more important than that preacher? Than the preacher? Or well, anybody, or even this, him, even or that you, tree. or me, or um, anyone. Or, or here, even really. that fly that was flying around us. Well, he's definitely more important than the fly, but that's well, another discussion. No, 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 actually, why? 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 why is he more important than the fly? Why is he more important than the fly? For me, and for us, for, and for humans, for, he is. Under your worldview of agnosticism? Yes, for me, for humans, for us overall, he's more important. Because if, uh, let's say, you die, I mean, some things will change, of course. The people who you are friends with, your family, blah, 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 everybody will mourn, probably. Uh, some things will be lost. But it won't be the same loss as if Stephen Hawking died. I mean, he did die already. I know that he died. But if he died but before, that, that's purely he invented subjective. the things that he I mean, I, I can imagine a lot of it Christians less, looking at him dying and saying, well, good riddance. And, I could, can, yeah, I, and, and some people, he could, be a, he could technically be a cult leader, right? And his followers would be like, this is great, we value him more. So what I'm trying to get at is that under your worldview, there is no difference between, say, a fly and Stephen Hawking. Yes, there is. How? Because for me, he's better. And for humans, I would argue... Be better argue better objectively? Better. better as objectively as I can get. Okay. It's objective for me, but my objectivity isn't an absolute for everybody. Unless I can prove it to the others. So, so give me evidence that under agnosticism... Evidence, exactly. Yeah. Give me evidence under agnosticism, Stephen Hawking's is worth more than a flea or fly. The, the, than a flea or a fly or yeah. whatever. Because of his scientific theories, because of the advancements he made, he made humanity go forward and understand better the world in which they are. And humans, they succeeded against other animals, not because they're stronger or faster or whatever. It's because of their understanding, their adaptation to the world. So to understand the world means to dominate the world. And humans need that understanding to be dominant in this world. It's actually the other way around, in, uh, if you look at it sociologically. The more intelligent people are, the less children they have. The more people are involved in studying nature, the less children they have. Yes, yes. Um, Isaac Newton died childless, right? And in fact, a religion or even a fly, they're more likely to reproduce than people who are spending a lot of time in things which are, we would consider yeah, to be yeah, intelligent. Yeah. You're completely right. You're completely right. But in this case, Stephen Hawking is not necessarily good for his own children, for his own uh, continuation of his being, you know, to have children, but for overall humanity. 
no, for the other humans is but, better than no, uh, but, random... Uh, but according creatures. to your criteria, Pavlo, it's not, because the more human beings start to understand the world, get into philosophy, get into science, get into these things, the less likely they are to actually have more children. That's true. And in fact, the more they, the less they understand the world, That's the true. more they can, children they're going to have. That's true, but that could be changed. That's a flaw that could be mitigated, that could be reduced. Now, what I'm trying to show is at the moment your worldview is not coherent. Because you're saying the objective is the continuation of humanity. Yes. And I'm trying to show you if you believe that to be the case, forget scientific advancement. It's just about having lots of things to eat and having lots of sex. No, it's not. Because this planet has a time limit. Has it? Has a time limit. Right. This planet is not eternal. Eventually, in the, I don't know how many years, how many centuries or whatever, this planet will disappear. And if we stay here forever, we will disappear. And thus, people like Stephen Hawking are very important for humanity to have, to advance and to spread to other places. But couldn't we argue, additionally, that it's the very advancement of humanity, it's the very progress of humanity, the industrialization and the scientific revolution, which, le which is leading to the climate change, which is leading to all the problems in the planet actually possibly dying a heat death. Because if we were simply hunter-gatherers and we didn't understand nature and we were just, we, we would we have a much lower human population and we wouldn't have destroyed the planet. No, I disagree. Because if we did that, then even though we might live longer, we might exist longer, we are certain to die on this planet. There's no chance we'll go somewhere else right. if we don't advance. Now, so, if we do advance, there's a possibility we might survive. Sure. Now, under your worldview, would you say the most important thing is the survival of the species? Yes. Okay. You do realize that contradicts Darwinism? In which way? Darwinism, it works by natural selection, working at the gene level. And the most important thing is the preservation of our genes. Not even preservation of organisms, let alone species. Yeah, but my genes are part of the human species. If I preserve my genes, I preserve the human species. And more than that, if... That, that's not necessarily true. With humans it is. Well, homosexuality. Huh? Do, you, do you agree with me? What? Homosexuality. What does it have no, to no, do that, with that's not, that's not, no, 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 that's not related to the discussion. <laughs> anyway, uh, look. Do, do you understand the problem I, I raised? I understand the problem you were, you're raising, but I would say that humans are not, for example, you know bed bugs, for example, disgusting creatures. Who? Bed bugs. Right. Yeah. Disgusting creatures. But the son of a bed bug female can have children with the mother and there's not going to be inbreeding. With humans, there is going to be inbreeding. It's a taboo. And it's a taboo for a reason. It cannot be done. Simply no. Inbreeding is a complete taboo. Because, mainly, because humans uh, will have uh, children with mental problems. They will have uh, like children who have, uh, you know, arms growing out of the chest. That's an exaggeration. No, 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 I, I get that. But you get what I mean, yeah, right? Pa Pablo. So the benefit of humanity is the best thing for each individual human, I would argue. But look, the way we evolved, according to a Darwinian story, is man against man, woman against woman, child against child, pure survival of the fittest. And it's not about selection of the organism, uh, sorry, selection of the species or selection of the organism. It's about selection of the genes and it's a, 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 a fight for survival. Yeah. So it's not the case that we, from a Darwinian perspective, you all need to cooperate and then we'll all get along. Ultimately, all of this veneer of civilization, ethics, morals, it all breaks down to man against man. In fact, look, the way I like to think about it is the film The Joker, right? The new uh, one. The new one, yeah. I watched it twice, I really liked it, right? So the guy, he believes he's just ahead of the curve, right? He thinks this veneer of society in which everyone's pretending to be nice to each other, underneath it, there's a veneer, uh, underneath the veneer is pure um, brutish and savage behavior, right? Now that selfish type behavior, that is what Hobbes spoke about, that's what Darwin spoke about, that's what the selfish gene idea is about. So your perspective, before we get into whether it's right or wrong, I just want to show it doesn't, it doesn't correlate with the Darwinian picture. Well, I never said I correlate on every single little thing that Darwin says. But I would say that what you're saying is a possible interpretation of Darwinism. But, but it's that's not the current interpretation. Sure, you could say that. But I, I, I won't even agree completely that it's the current interpretation. Because even though Darwin argues for a survival of the fittest, each one for himself, basically. With humans, it's a bit more complex. Because humans are not like um, tigers, for example. Tigers are solitary beings. Uh, humans are... Uh, oops. 
when humans are beings that survive in a society. Humans can't coexist well, can't survive if they don't work in a group. So yeah. they need to be compromises. Yeah, yeah, but you see, I don't, I don't disagree with that. But what the Darwinian picture tells us is those compromises, however they are layered, however they explained, underneath them there's pure selfishness. So for example, there's two ways they mainly try and explain the way we cooperate. Kin selection and reciprocal altruism. So you, Pavlo, yep. I'm going to be nice to you. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to compliment you about your ring or your jacket, or whatever, because I expect something back. That's reciprocal altruism. Or two. I like your beard. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Kin selection, right? Which is people that you share genetics with, you help them survive. So underneath these veneer, ultimately we don't care about anybody except for the preservation of our own genes. Sure, but uh, we are look. We are a bit more distant to people who are slightly different in terms of genes, but we are infinitely closer to any other human being than to other species in terms of genetics. Uh, so uh, yes, yes. I would say it's, um, it's like a spectrum of how much would you care for people who are slightly different in terms of genes, but are, who are still people, you know? Yeah, but the, so yeah but the problem then would be, Pavlo, is the way human beings behave around animals goes against the very notion that you just said and what the Darwinian picture tells us, which is that people sometimes say, I'm not going to have children, I have a dog, yeah. right? Which doesn't fit the Darwinian picture at all. Yeah, I disagree. I, I disagree with those people. It's no, no, you said. disagree. But what I'm saying is that behavior shows that the Darwinian picture is not correct. What do you mean? How does it show? Because human behavior is not... Uh, <laughs> it's just so dominant. I, 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 he saw the joke, WWE joke. video, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we do a second <laughs> round? Okay, no problem. So, sorry, uh, I think you were talking. No, you were. Oh, was I talking? <laughs> yeah. Um, what was the last thing you said? Um, it doesn't fit. You, you were saying that what I said doesn't fit the Darwinian. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So about this, the Darwinian theory is obviously going to make predictions about human behavior, and that. Predictions is going to be based upon their ideas of fixation of uh, alleles within a population, yeah. right? So they have evolutionary psychology, which is there to explain what human beings do and why they do them. However, the reason why that field is heavily criticized is there's lots of things human beings do which do not help our survival, such as yeah. me and you both give tax, yeah, yeah. whether we like it or not, for the survival of the unfittest at the hospitals, yes, right? Yes, yes. There's much, many human behaviors which don't fit the Darwinian picture. Yeah, compromises. Compromises to coexist in the society. I give money for tax so I can help the people in need, so that when I'm in need, I'll be helped. Yes, but why Why would you help somebody when you are, won't get reciprocation? And that's the problem with evolutionary psychology. Because human beings help people anonymously. They help people sometimes without ever wanting something back, which doesn't fit reciprocal altruism or kin selection. Because that desire to help is an evolutionary trait. It's something that I personally call genetic morality, you know. The example I always give is with cavemen, you know. When cavemen get attacked by wolves, a bunch of cavemen, right? Uh, all of them defend themselves, they stand together, they fight off the wolves, right? If one of them hides in the bushes while the others fight or climbs a tree, when he's in danger, they might think twice before helping him because he didn't, uh, didn't risk himself to help them. That's you know reciprocal I mean? altruism. Exactly. So, the caveman who was hiding in the bush will eventually get eaten by wolves, while the ones who didn't, the ones who have the genetic trait to help others, will keep living. You know what I mean? Yeah, but that, that, that particular example only explains if everything there that you said is correct and the variables aren't changed. If we change the variables from this perspective, sometimes a hunter-gatherer or a human being would fight and defend somebody else, knowing they're going to die, knowing they're not going to get any reciprocation, yet they still do it. Yeah. So in, in the cases that you're highlighting, these are minimum. In the vast majority of human behavior, you can't break it down to kin selection and reciprocal altruism because much of it is not based upon, I'm helping you because you're going to help me. I'll give you an example which we can both agree about. We both are having this conversation. We both believe truth is important. I'm not benefiting in terms of survival and reproduction, nor are you. You're not benefiting what? In terms of survival and reproduction. By this conversation? Yeah. Not directly. But if we uh, think by different steps Go to on. get there, we do benefit. Because, you know, if we speak to other people, if we conceive, if we create ideologies that are better to organize humans together, we will have a more functional society. And with a more functional society, we have better opportunities. And with better opportunities, we can have a higher possibility of children and then of um, uh, prosperity. But that wasn't my intention. 
It doesn't matter what your intention was. No, no, was. but, but if, if you say your intention was to make society better, which eventually is going to help you, yeah. I can just say my intention was to get to truth. To get where? To get to truth. To what truth. is true, yeah. To the truth. Well, sure. and, and truth doesn't always help your survival. In fact, knowing the truth can sometimes be detrimental to your survival. Of course. Yeah. And why do you want to know the truth? And this is the thing which is very interesting. So, for, and here I'm going to make a claim. I want you to challenge it. From an Islamic perspective, I can say truth is valuable because I believe in God. And God is the ultimate source of objective values. And God's name is the truth. So it, for me to believe in the ultimate truth and truth having intrinsic value is possible. But for an atheist or an agnostic, truth is only instrumentally valuable in terms of survival and reproduction, not intrinsically valuable. It is instrumentally valuable, but it also has an intrinsic, in, in, intrinsic value because of what I told you is the genetic morality. It simply got ingrained in our qualities as humans to want the truth. Okay, that would be instrumental, not intrinsic. Yes. I'll tell you why. Created by epigenetics and evolution. Because if it's from a purely biological perspective, then it's a proximate mechanism. Morality is a proximate mechanism. It's not an ultimate goal. It's not an ultimate desire. Therefore, truth from your perspective can only ever be instrumental. Well, that depends on what you mean by instrumental, but I guess I would agree with that. Uh, except that the, that instrumentality has become part of us, has become intrinsic, you know? Okay. I, so we can't even change it, even if, even if we decide it. It will take a lot to change No, I, I, I think that there's, there's two different things here. The first thing is about us in instrumentally recognizing that truth only has value under an atheistic or agnostic worldview in terms of a benefit it gives us. Yeah. The second is natural selection sometimes creates quick and dirty solutions, right? So what it does is rather than telling you, Pavlo, that truth doesn't have uh, intrinsic value, truth only have an instrumental value, it gives a shortcut. And, sure. but. From a metaphysical point of view, your worldview cannot justify truth having intrinsic value. You've just been um, deluded by natural selection to have this belief. And the thing about natural selection is this. Natural selection, we have to make a distinction between adaptive fitness and truth fitness, right? Adaptive fitness and truth fitness. Truth fitness, so yeah. So adaptive fitness is something that helps with our adaptation to help us survive. Truth fitness is, does it help us arrive at truth? Natural selection doesn't give a damn about truth. All it cares about is survival. And if survival happens to correlate with something which is true, then it will make us value truth. Otherwise, it will inculcate within us false beliefs to help us survive. Yeah. I mean, in a way. Look, the problem with, uh, with this is that I agree with, part of partially I agree with what you're saying. Because it's very possible to use the impulses to, to use the impulses. Another of, fight. <laughs> yeah, now it's Rajinator trying to fight Ali. Right. Five minutes, Raj, five minutes. We're having a conversation here. Tell him to kiss him, Because you think that you are. Just say no homo, bro. Just say no homo, bro. He's got the mask, he can't kiss now. Anyway, let, let's try. Let, let, let's try and let's try, to, let's try and wrap this up. Yeah, let's try. So anyway, um, anyway, lots of interruptions. Yeah. So anyway, um, getting getting to the bottom of it, I believe from an agnostic or atheistic perspective, there's lots of metaphysical problems in terms of value judgments, in terms of the way we are as human beings not fitting with the original story. And I just want to highlight one small thing which you said, which I didn't uh, comment on. There's parts of Darwinism you agree with and parts you don't agree with from the sound yeah, of this conversation. I also, uh, oh, he left. Uh, because I also like epigenetics. Epigenetics is an interesting theory. Too. Yeah. You know, about, uh, about how humans... Are you a Lamarckian? Uh, who? A Lamarckian. No. Do you take it as far as Lamarck? In terms of in yeah, 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 I, I heard them, but uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm a Lamarckian. Look, basically, uh, there are some experiments that go a bit against evolution, that they prove that uh, so, changes can so, happen faster okay. than evolution so, implies. They don't go against evolution, they go against natural Darwin's, selection. Darwin's theory. Darwin's theory. Darwin's I'm glad theory. you know the difference. Yeah, of course, because evolution has been changing. Yeah. It's not just Darwin's It's evolving. It's, it's evolving, yeah, in a way it's evolving. It's been changing, it hasn't remained the same. Yeah. So, in a way, I agree with it, but not necessarily with Darwinism, because Darwinism is a bit outdated these days. Yeah, that's something we can agree about.
well, it, it's kind of accepted by <laughs> scientists at this point. But so yeah, my point. Let's end it there before we Let, okay, before another sure, fight. Um, let's end. Stop what you're talking about. Is it in the book? What? Which one? The, the Iron Relic. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. No? But, yeah, Sorry, but the fact that it evolved, I think, makes it more uh, trustworthy than things that people claim to be absolute and eternal, that humans wrote. I think it makes it more trustworthy because it evolved, because it changed. And that's the nature of mankind, to change, to adapt, to improve. But, no, but there's, look, there's something, um, I, I think there's a confusion here. We shouldn't just juxtapose science and then the belief in God or belief in something absolute. I believe they can, they can correlate, even though science changes and these types of things happen. The way I see science is science is a way of getting closer to God, because science is an attempt to explain how the world works. God is an explanation for why anything exists in the first place. Now in terms of epigenetics, or whether it's genetics, whether it's Lamarckian evolution or Darwinian evolution, you still, under an agnostic worldview, cannot show truth having anything except instrumental value, not intrinsic value, because it's a philosophical discussion, not something that can be resolved using scientific data. Yeah, but neither can you. Just because you're sure that your idea of God is absolute, doesn't make it absolute. Our certainty of something doesn't make it a true uh, reality. You know? But it's, look, firstly, before I give evidence for why my worldview is true, on the minimum is coherent. On the minimum is coherent, yeah? Meaning, under my worldview, because I believe in God, intrinsic uh, values such as truth, such as good, right, wrong, these things, they do have a grounding. But under an agnostic or atheistic worldview, the only way you can try and ground your worldview is either using Kantian ethics, uh, utilitarianism, virtue ethics, or whatever ethical system, and even those are based upon certain assumptions which can be challenged. But I don't think you're different to that, because Islam, just as, as Christianity, has had rules that have changed through the times. I mean, you might argue against it, but even if we go through the history of the Quran, the Quran wasn't written by Muhammad. It wasn't even written by the uh, closest people to him. It was written by the followers, and then it was compiled by the scribe of Osman, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's that's not true. No, Abu Bakr, scribe of Abu Bakr, yeah. And that's Osman, he oh. burned all the different Qurans that he didn't, didn't see fit to be the right Quran. So I would say it's open to interpretation. Uh, who is the actual prophet? Okay. Is it Muhammad? Is it his followers, the scribe, Osman? I would say uh, that, like well, look, th this, that's wrong on multiple levels. Okay, okay. so l l let's start off here. When it comes to the Quran that we have today, the physical copy of the Quran, all over the world, what's the primary way that you've understood the preservation of the Quran? Is it oral or is it um, written? Oral. Oral. If it's oral, then what you just said right now is incorrect. It's incorrect uh, if you consider the Quran... Because uh, you and your analogy was, preser was physical, well, wasn't oral. No, it's incorrect if you consider oral preservation on the same level as written preservation. But do you know what the Muslim perspective is? Our perspective is the oral is the primary and the written is the secondary and it's not even needed. Yeah, but I disagree with that perspective because for me it doesn't make a lot of sense that something that you remember and you pass through with words is more trustworthy, remains more uh, exactly the same than something you write down. Shall I tell you why? The reason for that is a fundamental problem in epistemology, right? Do we believe empiricism is primary or do we believe testimony is primary? And I believe there's a very good case that can be made, whether you're a Muslim or an atheist, the greatest form of knowledge and the strongest form of knowledge is testimonial truths, not empirical truths. That's the majority of the beliefs that we hold in our head to be rational are purely testimony. For example, you're uh, Serbian or Ukrainian, right? Yes. Ukrainian. Okay, so in Ukraine, um, who, who was the ruler, say, 500 years ago? Exactly 500 years ago. Not roughly. Roughly, I'm not sure. Um, was Ukraine part of Russia at that time? Was it separate or...? I don't remember exactly. I remember, uh, I remember the transitions of Ukraine. First it was the Scythians, then it was the uh, Sarmatians, okay, the, the Sk Huns, the Gods went through, oh, then sure. it was the Kievan Rus, then it was the Cossacks, the Mongol invasion, blah blah blah. Okay, after the okay, Cossacks so it was the Russian Empire, after the Russian Empire, Soviet Union, after the Soviet Union, Ukraine. Nowadays. Sure. Everything you just said there is testimonial. Testimonial in the way that it was written. Not necessarily. No, because, because much of history is not written, it's actually testimonial. Yeah, sure. And if it is written, it's written based upon testimony. So testimony is primary. Yes, we're going to wrap it up because he's been trying to wrap it up for a while. Okay, yes, well, here you go, have the last word. word.
Salam Corner, do you like these discussions? <laughs> Very good, very good discussion. So about that, history, the only things that count as history is what's written. That's the definition of the word history. What is uh, transmitted with words only becomes history when it becomes written. That's why we don't know a lot about uh, civilizations or cultures that didn't write a lot, like the Sarmatians, the Scythians, don't have as much as the Russian Empire or the Kievan Rus that wrote. When you write something, it becomes more certain and, more, uh, and better ingrained in history. That's what the meaning of history is. Okay, so let's do this next week or the week after if you're here. Here Let's start off the discussion at that point. Thank you for joining us. Thanks.